On the bright side, there are no double headers left on the Guardian schedule as of this moment. The bad news is there's still a month to go in the season, and the weather is about as predictable as the Guardian's performance at this point. You are Locked On Guardian, your daily podcast on the Cleveland Guardians. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Now through September 22nd, all FanDuel customers can get $5, can bet $5 and get a three-week free trial of NFL Sunday ticket from YouTube and YouTube TV. Visit FanDuel.com slash Locked On to get started today. You're muted, my friend. I don't, I don't even know how I didn't mute myself that time. That's very weird. On today's show, Guardians, another double-header disaster for them. We'll talk about it, I guess, because we kind of have to. Uh, we'll just talk about that. And if there's any moves the Guardians can make that can really, really can fix this thing or what the really, really answers are at this point, there's still a chance for them to split the series. And we said coming in that a split would be acceptable. There's still a chance for them to do that. So we'll talk about that. In the third segment, we didn't get to enough minor league stuff on Monday, so we're going to push it to today. We've got two very notable news items in the Guardians minor league system. So we promise after we talk about the doubleheader, we're going to try to talk about it as little as we can because it was brutal. Uh, we will spend the entire third segment on the farm system where there is, unfortunately, some more bad news, but also some good news. Sorry. I can't promise can't, all good news. Can't have I'm nice not a things. weatherman. I'm not a weatherman. I can't predict all good things. I'm sorry. No, why, why can't we have nice things, Justin? Why, why can't we have? Because nice we things? are from we are based in Cleveland. I'm based in Cleveland. You're not based in Cleveland, but you were based in Cleveland. That's all I can think of. No, no I, I, I don't know. It's the just, river's not catching on fire anymore. What other, what other jokes kind of go back to? Well, the lineup isn't catching fire either. That's part of the problem. Oh, uh, but for those who do not know me, I am Jeff fun. Ellis, one of your two co-hosts here. Before. I uh, was the co-host of Locked On Guardians. I was the main host, one of the original hosts of the Locked On MLB Network. By that, I was a lead draft and prospect analyst at Scout 24-7. And before that, I was your second favorite blogger at every Cleveland sports blog that has and will ever exist. We're and sticking with two. What was two. yesterday's two? Yesterday's two. Um, I gotta write these down. Wait. I had already forgotten it. I just get so depressed by these games. My memory goes. You're not making my... the adjustments. No, I think I, it was it was two because it wasn't baseball related. It was two because it was my son's last day as a two year old. He turned three today. That's what it was. Okay. Well, that's so, a good thing. Happy birthday to your son. That's yeah. That's a good thing. Uh, Guardians gave him no old. gifts. Yeah, they sure they didn't give anybody any gifts at all. Um, I was at that game on the, the night game on Monday. There were no gifts to be had in that one. Hopefully, we bring you a gift in the form of therapy and other things that aren't necessarily guardians game related i'm just a lot of the other co-hosts i've written about the guardians minor league farm system and some of the major leagues since 2007 it's been a long time all the way back when grady sizemore was playing i heard i saw an interview somewhere else today which was cool um i met the news herald the morning journal guardians baseball insider all that good stuff not good stuff guardians are one in 17 and double headers going back to last year. It's been tough. And <laughs> double header is almost like I don't want to say a coin flip, but like it's normally the I don't know, cliches exist for a reason, but cliches also lack context. Normally it's like a coin flip, right? Like you have a double header and they're designed to be sweet because it's just a the way it's set up. Like it's very hard when one team uses a lot of um it's ammo for one game. It's hard to do it in a second game, especially when it comes to the bullpen. Guardians did not get it done in either reason. And and I, I think the real issue for the Guardians in terms of doubleheader issues the last two years, it goes back to starting pitching. If you have good starting pitching, you can win a doubleheader because at least one game you can have you can count on one of your starting pitchers to carry you. Um the Guardians kind of had that in game one, I guess. Like Nick Sandlin was fine. Eli Morgan was good for six batters, and then Stephen Vogt decided he needed to face seven, eight, and then nine or something. Not sure why that happened, but then Barlow was good. Gaddis gave a run. Like they they pitched fine in game one, truthfully, you know, except for like two batters. And then game two just was it was kind of a, an abject disaster. But the thing that's most frustrating with the doubleheader is that the Guardians, we said, like we said they were set up for success in this series because. They took two or three from Texas. You had the big blowout Saturday. 
and you had guys rested for Sunday, and you were facing a lefty in game one, even though it was Cole Reagans, who's really good. Well, Reagan struggled. He threw 94 pitches in four innings. He walked a lot of guys. This team hits lefties well they, for most of the year they have. And the Royals don't have a good bullpen, so this should benefit the Guardians because a doubleheader is taxing on your bullpen. The Guardians have a great bullpen. This should have been set up for the Guardians to at least split the doubleheader. And they didn't. And if I can, I went, you know, last week I said, I think, I think you were not on with me. I think you were out, but I said that extra inning win against the Yankees in New York was like the biggest win of the year, considering how that game started out and just where they were in the standings. They needed a winner for that Milwaukee series. And then I said, you know, it doesn't mean anything if they don't follow it up with any success. And they, they didn't. Um, so I think the reverse is maybe true here. This has a chance to be one of the worst days of the season for them if they don't rebound on Tuesday and Wednesday. The good news for the Guardians, if you want some silver linings, is like you have Gavin Williams and Tanner Bybee the next two days. So. Yeah, this was like if you're looking on paper and you're like, hey, they split this series, you're going to look at it and be like, hey, they, they won the last two and lost well, we the two. Like on paper, if they can do it, and you know, we feel a lot better at the end of the day. Of course, there's no guarantee of that, and it, it stinks a lot right now, but they're still set up to conceivably get a split. You have those two guys going, and that's it's a lot harder now. But yeah. It's harder, but that's who, like I said, I think anyone who's paying attention would have been like, oh, they split the series? Okay, this is this is where it happened. Like This is just, this is the part where they win these two after losing the other ones. Like That's just the way I think anyone who's been paying attention would have you know, picked. Right, and we even said that yeah, on, on Monday's show. I know we had better listeners on Monday than we did last week when they were losing, which I'm sure we're going to have lower listenership today, which that's fine. We appreciate all the dieharders and the Yeah, everydayers. we appreciate People all of our everydayers. Who was the what? Yeah. Did you write down the person's name who uh, said oh, very I kind didn't. things? It was, it was a great comment. It was somebody from... We'll, 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 we'll give you a shout-out eventually. Let's put it that way. I didn't yeah. get the comments today. We had kind of a late go. You were at the game. I had a birthday. So we'll apologize to that every day, and we will definitely give them a XI, tomorrow. It's X, XI Bo X. So XI Bo X is from Louisiana, said that they don't get a lot of coverage down there, and this is the first real consistent coverage they've gotten of their favorite baseball team. So we're, we're happy to have all people like you along, even if they lose. We're trying to, you know, talk about the reality of the situation for the Guardians. And the reality is they're a game up right now. And again, if they don't, if they don't bounce back on Wednesday, or I'm sorry, Tuesday, to this loss, then I think you look at Monday as, as one of the worst days of the season because they had chances. Again, historically with double headers, like you, I, I have to go look at the history of all double headers, but like you, it's it seems mathematically impossible to be one in seventeen in your last eighteen games when there's a double header. Like that just seems mathematically impossible because that's you know the odds say and double headers are hard, <laughs> but apparently the guardians, it's much harder to hit than it is to play in a double header. And they had chances in game one. Again, it's four walks. I think that's the issue, right? Is, is in game one, you had Cole Reagan's on the ropes and then you forced, he left with, with cramps because it was a hot day in Cleveland. He wasn't, you know, maybe hydrated enough. James MacArthur has not been good this year. Chris Bubich is not, has not been a good pitcher historically. John Schreiber has had a tough year, although he's finally healthy. So I think that has something to do with it. And then, you know, you had a uh, you had a deficit against Lucas Ersig, who hasn't given up a run since he got traded to the Royals. And the Royals had a great trade deadline. Like, they gave up nothing to add the guys they added. And it's the, all the guys they've added have really helped them out. So kudos to the Royals there. I know nobody wants to hear that. But the pitching plan was super weird in game one, but it kind of worked. Like, the only thing is, you know, vote left. Eli Morgan in way too long. And then Gaddis gave a home run for the second day in a row. But, you know, if you take Morgan out when you, you know, after six batters and you stop trying to get too cute or something um, or, or go too long with him, everything else worked to plan. I mean, even Connor Gillespie gave you two shutout innings. Like everything went according to plan. You walk, you had Cole Reagan's on the ropes and they had to use what? One, two, three, four relievers. So they had a lot of bullpen guys that weren't available for the second game. And the second game went worse than the first game. So it's like, just again, there's no such thing as momentum, right? Like, it's just how you show up and how you play the game. And 
everything kind of fell apart for them in, in game two after a great start. You had three runs off Alec Marsh. They had Alec, Alec again, they had Alec Marsh on the ropes too, right? Like they had, he didn't walk a lot of guys, but they had three runs in the first inning. He had the, almost 40 pitches to the first two innings. And then he finished the game getting into the fifth and he threw 87 pitches in the next three innings. So, and they had two lefties come out of the bullpen. Again, a team that hits lefties well all year didn't hit lefties. They had four score four in the third score all settings from lefties in the bullpen for a team that's supposed to hit lefties. I don't have to tell you. Well, I mean, they're not, you know, you and I were talking about this off air, but I think one of the big things is they're not hitting anything right now. And they haven't like the, it's been bad contact for two months and it's just kind of weird because they were so good at the start. And it's, you know, you have Jose playing well and Naylor and Quan, unfortunately now both like, Naylor is average, which is below average at first base, and Quan is below average in terms of production. It's like the league figured them out. They made adjustments. Why, as a team, are they, instead of making adjustments, why are, why have they decided that their their title should be Jose and the Pop-Up Kings? Like, you know, they love pop-up markets. This team must spend all their time going to any pop-up store that occurs because, boy, do they love popping up right now. I know we've got a lot of commenters like they're trying to hit home runs. And it's like, I don't, I don't think that's the case. I think the problem is, again, this is the same issue you've had for the last couple of years. You've got a lot, you've got a lot of hitters that don't strike out. They reach to put the ball in play instead of striking out because, you know, like, like we heard Quan come into the year saying, okay, it's okay to swing and miss more, but with two strikes, you still try to put the ball in play. You know, if you've got a runner on and there's one out, if you hit a ground ball to second base, a strikeout's better than that. Like, and I know there's some people who are going to say, well, striking out's terrible. Well, a strikeout is a heck of a lot better than a weak ground ball to short with one runner on first. Like, yeah. you know, there are certain situations where it's better and, and they have a hard time with hitters who just don't know. Like, I, I know everyone likes to harp on us for how much we harp on John Ken's and Wells chase rate, but like they have a lot of guys in this team who chase a ton. Andre Semenis chases out of his own a ton. Yeah. Naylor does. Noel does. Bo Naylor chases a ton. Like the only guys in this team that don't chase are really Quan, Jose, and Rocchio. Like those are the only guys that don't really chase out of the zone. Now that you say but, that, it's like makes more sense why we heard, uh, you know, the Jock uh, that they had some kind of interest in Jack Gaglio because the same thing, right? Chase and contact was his numbers, and and it's not gone well for him so far in the minors. But um, yeah, yeah, it's it's a weird profile that they're digging into, even though it is not a profile that sets up for success. Yeah, like Will Brennan's hit the ball well since he's come back from Columbus, but he has like he's allergic to walks. It's, it's a sixteen to one strikeout to walk ratio, and it's like that's not sustainable. Like you have to have better patience, and all these guys have to learn that there are pitches that maybe they are strikes. Like not everyone's going to be Juan Soto. One, and this is why like there was a great article on Baseball America about Travis Bazana, and he talks about how like. Even if you take a strike on the edge of the plate, you have to recognize, like, okay, even if I swing at that, what am I going to do? Am I going to pop it up? Am I going to ground it out to the second baseman? Big deal. If I strike out versus a ground ball, and you're, the counter argument is, well, what if the second baseman makes an error? Not a lot of second basemen make, make errors on 86 mile hour ground outs. They just don't. So, like, putting the ball in play, yeah, because you put the ball in play, maybe there's a runner at third with less than two outs that works. But if there's a runner at first base, you're probably not making an error. And that, it's not going to help you. Like, so there has to be development to discern that. And I'm not saying that's the only problem. Like there's a lot of problems with this offense. They had it, but the other side of this is they had a good first half, right? Like you still have Quan who made, who did make adjustments coming into the year. And like you said, the league adjusted back to him. So he has to make adjustments back. Hasn't happened yet. Josh Naylor last year, we thought figured out how to hit lefties. He did well to start the year. He's not now. He has to adjust back. Some of these guys do have a track record. So we know the success is there. That's why I think it's yeah. it's frustrating, but it's like. Who, well, who, we should probably focus on that after our break, though, right? Do a little bit more before we sit back and dig into the good, the bad, the ugly, and the interesting of the minor leagues. Yeah, we'll get to more minor league stuff in segment three. We'll wrap up the Royals and. Other potential moves that will all spill in to segment three. We focus on the minor leagues today, stuff we didn't get to on Monday. Again, good news and bad news from the minor league system. We talked about FanDuel a lot on the show all year. Why? Because they have a great deal going on all the time. They are America's number one sports book, and we have something a little bit different for you right now for FanDuel. 
now through September 22nd. So you guys still have a month left to take care of this, take advantage of this deal. All FanDuel custom, customers, if you bet $5, you get a three-week free trial of, of NFL signing a ticket from YouTube and YouTube TV. With a YouTube TV base plan, you can watch every single regular season Sunday afternoon out-of-market game. So all you need is a Google account and a current form of payment. You can cancel this any time. I, again, I've, I've shared this with the people before. Uh, last year, I had, it was a great to be able to share uh, Sunday ticket with a lot of friends. It's a great product. I, I love it for my fantasy team. I don't necessarily love it for any individual team, but uh, for fantasy, it's awesome. But maybe you do like an out-of-market NFL team. This would be a big help for you. Um, and getting that free trial is, is super awesome, too, from FanDuel. And it's super easy to do. Just looking at FanDuel odds right now, things look a little bleak for Cleveland right now. But, again, they are still the favorites in the AL Central. If FanDuel likes them at minus 120, they are still favorites there. So that's, you know. They haven't changed their line over there, even though the Guardians are only one up in the division. But visit FanDuel.com slash LockedOn to download America's number one sportsbook. Finish up Lockdown Guardians today. Thank you for being with us today uh, as an everydayer, wherever you get your podcasts. We appreciate that. I know we appreciate you listening to our pal Sully if you're a big fan of Major League Baseball in general. Other news going on over there all the time. Check out Sully on Lockdown MLB. After Lockdown Guardians, part of the podcast, Lockdown Podcast Network, your team every day. Game two, you know, Jose Jose showed up. He had three doubles. He, he had the, the RBI two-run double in the first inning, which was great. He got to third because of some hustle. Quan led the game off the hit, so that felt really good. Things were pretty good. Logan Allen tiptoed around a rough first inning, had some walks. And honestly, I didn't mind the walk to, to Bobby Witt. Like, yeah, I didn't either. Bobby Witt. Yeah, don't pitch to those guys. Like, if, if teams want to pitch around Jose Ramirez that way, do it to, to Soto and Judge and Witt and all those guys. Um, there's just a lot of hard contact, a lot of loud outs. And that continued. And then the wheels kind of started to fall off. In the fourth inning, you know, they tied the game at three in the fourth inning. And then I just couldn't figure it out why he was allowed to come out for the fifth inning. And the Royals took the lead. Not really a shock. Like, Logan Allen has, has really regressed this season to a guy that looks a lot like a fringe starter. Like, he looks more like a guy that you call up for a doubleheader versus a guy that um, you would want in your rotation one through five versus where he started the year is like you're – your third or fourth most important starter. And he had a great, I think he had a great April, didn't he? Cause he, he threw, no, that's not true. He's not no, had a good month at all. There was no good month. Yeah. There's, there's no, no good month. month. Yeah. I was looking at the data. It's like a year ago. His change up was the legitimate plus offering. Mm -hmm. And right now it's not. And there's, there's like little things in the data that kind of show like why it may not be the case, but man, it's, uh, if he doesn't have that pitch, then there's just nothing. Because his command, pick. yeah, I mean, his command is a 50. Every other pitch is a 40 to 45 to 50. He needs that changeup to be a 55, 60 pitch to make it work. Um, so it's, yeah, it's definitely a situation where he's just, I mean, he's dangerously close to being a, a 4A guy, right? Mm hmm. Yeah, right now he is. I mean, I, again, that's why he was called up to make this start. But, like, hopefully you don't need him again. You go back to Alex Cobb when he's healthy. Like, he is at the point where you just – I thought when they sent him down originally the first time, it was like, okay, this is just for him to work on a few things. He'll come back, he'll reclaim that spot. We'll see if he adjusted or not. But, like, he is just not adjust, adjusted. Even if you look at his minor league numbers, like, he's not striking guys out. He's not missing bats. He's just getting away with it in AAA because you're facing – Triple A hitters. And again, I know this is a lot of people aren't going to like this take, but there is a massive gap between triple A and the majors anymore. So when you say like, got to call this prospect up, he's got to be up. You got to have him up. That's fine. Like I, I'm on board with replacing anybody who's not, who not who's not helping you win right now um, within reason, but also understand that there's such a gap in triple A Cleveland. I don't want to, I don't want to in, insult anybody. I'm not trying to insult anybody, but we as Clevelanders, I think we're all guilty of this. We have backup QB syndrome. Is it the guy that hasn't failed yet? You know, whether it's Valera or Manzardo, whoever, Chase DeLauder. The guy who hasn't failed yet is the most popular guy in Cleveland because 
we've all seen the guy who's failed, the, the starting quarterback, the, the pitcher, the outfielder, the center, whoever, it doesn't matter. The guy who has failed, you know, we're done with him. We've seen enough. He's failing. We're, we don't want to see it. But the guy we don't know anything about, the guy we haven't seen yet, hasn't failed yet, which is the same thing with, with prospect lists at some sites. It's like we haven't yeah. seen the guy who's failed, so we want to see that guy up. But we don't – we we believe that that's the answer. It's not the answer. Like, It's not not the answer either, though, right? Like at some right, point you yeah. need to – you. you that the you know they've put themselves in a corner with guys like Valera. Like you have to at some point try him. You've invested that's in him. And you do a, things. Okay, but that's not only their fault with Valera. No, I know like, it's also I, Valera being made of glass. Uh, you know he. Yes, I really en- injuries. I enjoyed him, him in the Unbreakable here. film franchise. You know, Mister Glass there. But um, he he yeah, that's a big part of it's on him. But now he's performing, and you have to keep yes. him on the roster next year. Like he is the one guy where you can't really make a good case for not because they need more left-handed bats they need you know he's he is the guy that like manzardo i'm i'm a huge supporter of i'm still a big believer of and this is not but it's like he's got time Valera doesn't he's the one guy where i think there is a rational case to have the quarterback syndrome for because you need a left-handed bat he doesn't have options left he has been a top prospect he's did i already say he's killing the baseball yeah like there's a lot of there's a lot of positives in that profile. And he was, you know, there is a point in time where people were debating him versus Bo Naylor for the top prospect in this organization. And Bo Naylor is, I mean, I know he's having his struggles, but he's still an interest top hitting prospect. I should say, but it's like, he's been that guy. And yes, there was a time where Valera and Rokia were the top two young hitters in this org. So maybe it doesn't mean anything, but I, I think you got to try. That's the one guy that I don't think there's an excuse for not trying sooner rather than later. Yeah, that's fine. As long as everyone understands that bringing George Valera up doesn't mean George Valera is going to fix all of a sudden. No, he might poop the bed. Offense, or or the offense isn't magically fixed, and Valera is the answer to the all. You know, he's the Rubik's cube solver. Like at the end of the day, again, I, we keep going back to this, and it's absolutely right. And people are mad at the front office for not doing more at the trade deadline, and that's fine. Like there you can be mad. A lot to get. That's, I know. That's one thing I'll stand like, by. I know that, but also. The other issue, the other half of that is maybe you didn't have the prospects to make a trade because the farm system wasn't very good and you spent all this time and resources on the farm system hasn't, we talked about off the air, has had a very low hit rate in terms of what they really need. Like you've got Bybee and Williams, that's great. We thought Logan Allen was part of that. He's clearly not right now. And then you've got a bunch of hitters like Rokio who just haven't figured it out offensively. And, you know, Noel has good nights and bad nights and Monday was a bad day and they, you know, Quan, but at the end of the day, Quan, Quan has to be a leader for this offense. He can't, what is he doing in August? He's hitting in the second half, in the second half overall, Quan's hitting 201, 282, 313. Your leadoff hitter can't do that. The guy that's was, was the, was an all-star the first half. You're relying on him. He can't do that. Um, Josh Naylor can't go into the tank the way he has, um, Lane Thomas was a terrible acquisition. I'm sorry. He has been almost to the point where, like, if this keeps up the rest of the year, you have to wonder about him being non-tender going the next year because it's just so bad. I Like, it's crazy to me that that guy could the last two years have a weighted runs created plus over 100. He gets to Cleveland. He can't find it. Like I said, that's what's so weird about it. Like, all reports where it's like he's a solid guy. He might be, you know, more of a platoon bat in the worst case. And it's like, nope, he's going to get here and just – He's going to get here and have the same struggles everyone else has. It is weird. It's like someone did Joe Boo put a curse on the, you know, can I make that joke anymore? It's like something is just wrong and they can't even the, the lack of adjustment and adapting and just everything is going wrong offensively. And yeah, it's, it's the chicken or egg argument, right? Like, you know, is it the coach that can't help them adjust or is the player just can't make the adjustment they're being asked to do? Like it's a chicken and egg thing, really. Like we, I mean, you built supposedly a smart team full of, you know, players who are all in, who can make adjustments. This is supposed to be a team that can make adjustments and they're not. So I don't know. To me, that's reminds me of a terrible interview last year where the response seemed to be, well, the other team gets paid too. So I just I can't get that statement out of my head, like just being that yeah. nonchalant about. I mean, well, you you like to get fixated on certain things. I do, you know. I do. Um, yeah, I mean, and you've got to. I don't want to sit here and blame anything on David Fry because he was again, he was an all star. He was one of the most important players of the first half. 
like obviously his his injury has really hamstrung their versatility and they don't want to put him on the injured list and I'm I'm again I'm guessing at this point with Fry I'm guessing like he hit a home run yesterday and that's all good it, you know if you look at the numbers basically all he's done is hit home runs and nothing else um and I'm not going to put it on him but it's like a big a big piece of what made him so important to this team was he could play right or left he could play first he could play you know, maybe third base if he really needed to. He did last year. He can DH, he can catch. Yeah. All he can do is pinch hit and play first base or DH now. And it's like, and he's not hitting anything more than home runs at this point. And well, it's really would... hurt. It's hurt yeah. what they're, they're able to do with this roster, which is, which is really, and I, I'm, again, I'm guessing at this point, the reason he's not on the injured list is because a 15 day stint isn't going to solve what his injury is. And that makes me think that makes me think that there's something more going Bigger. on there. But at the same anyway. time, like if he's not producing, then like just maybe it is yeah. time to do that. But uh, one last note. I know we got to run to a break here for all of our complaining, whining, moaning for all of our frustration. It's probably more of a better way to put it. This team's going to make the postseason. And, you know, the, the, it's at this point, Boston is, is punted away. We know what the postseason is already. Once this team makes the postseason, you don't need a ton. You can rely on the bullpen. And the farthest they got was arguably the worst team they had during that great run when they had all the aces. So you just, you got to get hot at the right time or, you know, teams get cold at the wrong time. Like with Freddie Freeman and Mookie Betts a year ago for the Dodgers. So for all of this, they're almost assured a shot in the postseason. It's like a 90, like over a 90% chance. They're pretty much in the postseason. Anything can happen. So let's just always keep that in mind at the back of our head. And a short series benefits this team because of the bullpen. <laughs> and um, now the rotation may not be great, but you can roll out Williams and Bybee. But but the advantage too, the reason we were you know so high on things is because oh this team gets to skip the first round. They can set up the rotation the way they want. They can get past the wild card, and you can leverage your bullpen. And you don't got to worry about your other starters. Well, yeah. you know maybe Matthew Boyd and Ben Lively are a little more reliable. You can set things up in different ways. Joey Cantillo was really good out of the bullpen, by the way. I, this is a yeah. role I wanted to see him in. I would like to see them keep him in the bullpen. We'll see what happens. Yeah. I would like to see that. I know he was the 27th man, so it doesn't really matter, but we'll see what happens from there. Let's we get into minor league stuff coming up here. We have what? I don't know. I said a weird prospects. Okay. It's, it's we okay. do have prospects. Some of them are good. Some of them are also hurt. We're going to get into that here in the final segment of today's Lockdown Guardians. Get supplies from the site that's made for skilled trades. Supplyhouse.com. Supplyhouse.com is a reliable way to order plumbing, HVAC, and electrical products. The easy-to-use website is packed with helpful resources and latest product info to help you get the job done right. Shop a complete inventory of over 200,000 parts from over 400 brands and get your order delivered right to your door with fast shipping from coast to coast. Need help with an order? Get expert support and industry-leading service from the friendliest folks in the business. Talk to a real person every time. I know I get tired of that automated service. Pros and skilled trades can get a competitive advantage by joining supplyhouse.com's free trade master program. Every trade master gets access to a dedicated phone line, free shipping and discounts on every order. Join the thousands of trade pros already benefiting from their free membership at supplyhouse.com slash TM and order plumbing, HVAC and electrical supplies from anywhere with just a few clicks at supplyhouse.com. Guardians and Royals will do it again. On Tuesday, it'll be Gavin Williams and Michael Lorenzen on Tuesday. Sounds right. I know they're facing Lorenzen in one of them. Yeah, check out the action on your SiriusXM app. Just search Guardians to find the broadcast. All right, so we we talked a little about the system on Monday, on Minor League Monday, but we didn't get to all of it, so we'll do more yeah, of it today. A very small amount. So let's let's yeah, we, we just mostly focused on Valera. On Monday, you can go back and listen to that. We probably won't do much Valera discussion. No. Because we just did it just now. But we have some news ahead of that before we get into some of the prospect performances. The first bit of news is uh, a guy who is no longer a Guardians prospect is Nate Furman. So he is on his way to be a San Francisco Giants prospect uh, for the rest of the season. I don't know if he's coming back this year. So Nate Furman has been out since the end of June with a shoulder strain. He has been on the the long-term injured list, the 68 injured list. So he's been out for quite a while at this point, um, which is really a bummer because Nate was having a fantastic season at Lake County. Um, guy who was, was showing a ton of on-base skills, contact, um, some, you know, a passive profile, but also one that could draw walks. Like 
he, he probably could have afforded a swing more, but it was also helping him draw walks. Um, and then that, you know, he had a hard time adjusting to high A last year when he got there, but this year came back as a really new guy, uh, was hitting for a little more power, had really made some, you know, Quan like adjustments. He was working on his um, approach, just different things. And he was showing a little more power. So he had, Nate Furman came into 2024 with zero career home runs. He had seven by June. He hasn't played since, uh, but he's the player to be named later for the Giants for Alex Cobb. So they now get Jacob Bresnahan, a left-hander from the 2023 class, and they get Nate Furman from the 2022 class. Um, I really like Nate Furman a lot as you know, a guy I've, I've talked to multiple times. Fun guy to interview, really personable. The organization, I really liked him. The coaches liked working with him. A lot of speed, a lot of contact. You know, was able to draw a walk, which is something this organization needs. And I really enjoyed his um, adjustments. I don't think he was like, I'm talking about a guy who was suddenly going to hit 20 home runs, but he might have been a guy who could hit 10, which is a heck of a lot more than he had before. When I mean, you combine with a guy who can steal and, and, and draw walks and make contact. And this guy who was, just, you know, probably a second baseman slash second uh, center fielder slash left fielder. You know, it's a very Ernie Clement. Uh, type role, so that's a, that's a good future major leaguer. I, I really just like that kid, and um, the Giants did well in who they targeted. We both like Bresnahan as as a arrow up guy. Yeah. I think Furman's a good bet to be a major leaguer in some sort of role. Uh, I I think he's a fringe guy. Like at best, he's a fringe player. So like it doesn't. So I, you and I kind of differ on him. Like he was never a, a guy that was close to top thirty for me. I mean, it's 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 a solid get for them, but he's like, I think he's a major leaguer. Just Again, it depends on the role. I, I just think he's a guy who will make the majors. That's all. I, I just, uh, like I said, I'm I'm not 100%. I, I, if Ernie I, Clement I, can, I think Furman can. I, but Clement had kind of that elite contact rate. I don't know. To make it, you typically have Furman. to have one one plus, plus trait. And Furman's that guy who's like 40 to 50 across the board. Maybe 60 speed. Maybe 60 I. Furman, you know. Furman's got 60 speed. You know, but I, you know, Clement, I think had 60 speed. It's a, like, I, I I don't know if there's quite enough, but it's not, I'm not here to bury him. It's a solid get. Brezhnehan was, was a really good get. Um, I think it's interesting. And if you're like, why didn't they just do this trade then? Like nothing has changed between now and then with Nate Furman. We don't know the other players on the list. It could be someone wasn't very, hasn't played well that they were looking at. Uh, could also be that if they were in contention, maybe they would have added a, um, a reliever that could have helped them and they're not in contention. Uh, it could also be that maybe they got to wait an extra month before having to cut someone from their system. Uh, but yeah, it is interesting that we waited a month for them to get a guy added who hasn't That's played intentional. since June. Yeah. And there was no oh, additional yeah, seeing for played. him. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm pretty sure they obviously agree on a list of players. It was going to, Oh, be you have to, competitive. That's the rule. Now I yeah. had a lot of people ask questions. You can't trade for guys who are just drafted. That's against the rules. You can't yeah. do, um, you know, like the Michael Brantley situation. That can't happen anymore. That's against the rules. So this is just literally there's a list of players and they can take anyone from that list. So yeah. it is. That's how it works nowadays. So the, it, it's it's a I'm really curious. To see different I, wish we, I wish we could find out who else is on that list, but um, we'll never, never find out because they don't want the players who were on that list to know. Yeah. If we do, it'll be like years after those guys yeah. are all out of the system. Um, another guy who won't be playing for the Guardian system the rest of the year is Jason Cheerio. So Ooh. he came out of a game over the weekend. He uh, rolled his wrist trying to catch a ball in, in the outfield, and he broke his wrist. So um, Cheerio's out for the rest of 2024. That rolls out a promotion to Lake County for the playoffs, which I was really hoping for because um, they are the one team in the, in the organization that is going to play playoff baseball September 12th. I'll see you there. Buy your tickets. We're still trying to make the Lockdown Guardians meet up a thing. I don't have anything official, but – Buy your tickets. I for sure will be there. And if there's something official, I'll hang out with whoever's there. Um, Churio had a good season, though. I mean, he was really hitting the ball well. Again, he cleaned up in the uh, the Carolina League. Like managers voted for him for a ton of awards. He had uh, best hit, best hit tool, most exciting player, best zone awareness, uh, best defensive outfielder, all that fun stuff. He walked a ton, didn't strike out. Um, you know, not a ton of power. He's still 44 bases. Still a guy who is growing into his frame. I still am pretty high on Churio. He was having a great season. Hopefully um, the wrist heals cleanly and he comes back next year with, with no issues. And that'll be in Lake County. Yeah, he's a very exciting player, right? Like he was one of those guys who really stepped it up this year. And that's why that's such a boo. Like he's clearly, 
clearly a top five prospect in the system. And yeah, I don't know. I think he, I, I think he's, he's pretty clearly there for me at least. Um, you know, just, I, I was going to mention passing one Brito hit a home run on, on Sunday. I don't think we, we talked about Ralphie. We you want to talk about Ralphie's catch yesterday. That was the other thing we forgot. To That's talk right. About. Yeah. We didn't get to Ralphie. I mean, the, Sunday there were a lot, the weekend in general for the guardian system was fun. Like, yeah. um, chase the water, his first triple a home run. Cooper Engel hit his first double a home run. Travis Bazana hit a, hit a go ahead home run the ninth inning for Lake County on the same day. Ralphie hit his first high, high eight home run. Um, but Ralphie on that game also had for, sorry, Friday night it was Friday night. He's playing left field. So Ralphie's played like, I want to say five or six games in left field, not a ton. And again, this is a kid who was drafted as a catcher. Who's only played first base. Ralphie. Let's put this. Let's get this out there. Ralphie is not a catcher anymore. He's not going to catch that. That's done. Maybe they revisit that long down the road or something. I don't know. It's, it seems unlikely. It's the bat. You're, you want Ralphie's bat to advance to the system. And he did that in Lynchburg. He's playing first base. I don't think that's going to change. But now he's getting some reps in the outfield, which is great. And if you haven't seen the catch, I, I wish I could show you on here. I think we'd probably get some. Yeah, we'd probably get of, hit with like a monetization issue. Yeah. So, but it was a great catch. It's on my Twitter feed. You can find it on Twitter. Um, just robbed a home run at the left field wall. Like jumped and timed it perfectly, made a catch. Again, this is a guy who's got like five or six professional games in the outfield and was drafted as a catcher slash first baseman. That's really impressive. Like, you know, you and I were talking about like, you know, maybe this is the Kyle Schwarber thing. I don't think Kyle Schwarber makes that catch. I don't <laughs> think I think that's a lot better than what Kyle Schwarber's ever done in the outfield. So I'm I'm super impressed. And it's been a rough go for Ralphie at high A so far. I know he hit the first home run on, on Sunday, which is great, but it's the bat and and the home run the home run robbery was awesome. Hopefully he's a viable left fielder. I, I think that when you make a catch like that, you prove that you um at least aren't out of water out there. Um, but you know, it's been it's been kind of a rough go for him. Offensively in triple A, he'll get it to there. Bazan is looking a lot better. I mean, you can just see like he had a two hit game over the weekend and he had Big two homer. walks as well. Yeah, the home run in the ninth inning was great. The captains were down. Huge. It was, uh, I think it was 109 off the bat, which is great to hear, especially. So a lot of fun. I'm hoping to talk to him Tuesday for the first time. I haven't had a chance to interview him yet. I'm hoping to to do that Tuesday. But it was a good weekend for the Guardian system. I mean, do you want to talk about some pitching still real quickly? I mean, yeah, I think we got to talk about the pitching real quickly, at least, because, you know, the double A arms continue to perform at a very high level. Yeah, Peterson had another, I think it was more of a quality start. It was three runs and in six innings, but he struck out seven. Uh, not as dominant as his last performance. Like, you know, he gave up a couple runs late in his last performance in Erie, but he was like overpowering hitters. I think he struck out nine in that game and one, it was like four in a row at one point. So he wasn't as good in this one, but he was still good. And Peterson continues to be a really good story this year. Messick's dominating. He looks really, I shouldn't say dominant. He looks really good in, in double A. And I don't know, I'm kind of falling victim to like watching Logan Allen and being a little concerned about Parker, Parker Messick because it's the same pathway so like there's very similar traits there so i just worry about messick's long-term viability i guess we'll we'll see i have to look closer to see like what differences and what similarities they have but i worry about that denholm was eastern league pitcher of the week he had eight shutout innings only threw 87 pitches um i still don't know if i buy denholm as a starter long term but he's really performed again like I, him in the I, pen. I just don't think double a is that big of a jump anymore I just don't. I think AAA is is the biggest jump because of how the minor leagues has been cut down so much. You just don't have a lot of guys at AA anymore. Um, everyone's getting the AAA, and if you're good in AAA, you're going to the majors. And AAA is for your your Logan Allen's and your you know your George Valeras or your guys who are still trying to make it or still haven't quite gotten there yet. So I don't know. AAA is is the this is the real proving ground. I'm, I'm, I'm a little sour on double A performances at this point. Uh, Walters pitched on Friday, but I, or over the weekend, I don't think Walters is coming up this year. I mean, maybe he will in September, but I'd be surprised because they're being very careful with his innings. Four of his last eight out outings have been one batter. And I think it's because he's reaching his career high in innings. Uh, Cooper, I so Cooper Engel hit his first home run. Dylan Delucia had it at his ninth straight shutout inning in a row over two starts. I'm really excited about Delucia so far. Coming off TJ, that's a lot of fun. Tristan McKenzie's last start was not good in AAA. I, I don't know. Are are both Logan Allen and Tristan McKenzie going to be on this roster in 2025? 
I hate to finish the, the show up with that, but like, uh, I mean, Mackenzie, will he have an option left? Does he have two right now? Like, uh, he's got he's, one op. This is his last option. Last option, actually, yeah. So right. and he's gonna and he's gonna be Next expensive year. Too, so they next got, year they he's going to be out of options. He's in, and he's going to be in arbitration next year as well, right? Or is he already in? He's already in arbitration. He might be. I don't know. Yeah. Well, his, his his arbitration can't be that expensive based on what he did in twenty twenty four. I mean, it'll be a repeat of whatever it is this year. So yeah, he's, what he's it never goes down. Four years. Yeah, it, yeah, it never, never goes, goes down. down. It only goes up. But it's back so, to back four years for him. It is, and oof, there's no easy answer there. It's. Lack of adjustments. Theme of the day. That's right? another. Pro- that's another problem for another day. Thankfully, right now Tristan McKenzie is not part of the problem for this Guardians team. The farm system is fun. Hopefully, the Guardians can earn a split against Kansas City. We'll talk tomorrow with you about Gavin Williams versus Michael Lorenzen. We're going to talk about perception and timing as well. I mean, would you have preferred the Guardians to have a first half like this and then have their second half be like what they did with Tito in the past years, where they were playing their best ball this season late in the year, but they had to catch up in the division. We'll talk about that a little bit. Uh, I think we're going to do a mailbag this week. We have to get into September call-ups. This September is almost here, and we'll eventually get just some, some thoughts on guys who are going to be Rule 5 eligible too. Yep. Thank you for joining us. Remember, rate and review, download daily. It helps. Do your part, and go, go, Guardians, go.